One of those Republicans that busted through and grew the number by almost double is here tonight. Hmm, good stuff. Yes, Bob Nardolillo is a new state rep, a Republican. They went from six in the House to 11 in the House from the November 4th results. And we're inviting all of the Republicans who have been uh, elected onto the show. And guess what? Because we're equal opportunity, we'll invite all the Democrats. In fact, if I had a conversation with all 75 reps, I'd be happy here because you need to know what these people are thinking since they're in our underwear and they're actually making the decisions. Uh, that would be our you know, governmental underwear. Um, and they're making decisions that are important to us. Actually, the less they do, I think the better off we would be. Anyway, uh, we'll find out what Mr. Nardolillo's philosophy is, talk about a success story in upsetting an incumbent, and all of that as we move along. We have a lot to do tonight. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you aboard on My State of Mind. Welcome. Let's check the rundown and see what we've got today. Yeah, never heard of that term when it comes to a mayor's office. I'm warning the Republicans, since Mr. Narlillo is here, he'll probably take notice of this, not to do that. Um, guess what? We're all that because somebody at MIT thinks we are. I'll tell you about the story and you'll hear from him. What else do we have tonight? You know, I thought this stuff was supposed to be secret. And have you seen the twos on the gas station signs? Kind of cool. And we'll check in with your state of mind as we go. Digging in. Laura, let's do it. COO. Yes, that's what they're calling Brett Smiley. Did you see the headline? How about this one on WDPRI.com? Former mayoral candidate Smiley to join Alora's staff. Now, you remember... Brett Smiley was one of the candidates running for mayor. He felt like he had to get out of the race and succumb to Jorge Alorza and meld his campaign in with Alorza because they needed to have less candidates beat the old evil one, Buddy Cianci, in their minds, certainly, right? Uh, first, they had to get by Solomon in the primary and then Cianci in the general election, and they did so. But it was clear that this was kind of a you know, an alliance of political convenience. And the natural questions to ask when they did this back during primary time were, uh, what was the deal? Like Dan McGowan peppering Brett Smiley and Jorge Alorza about it. We borrow it. Actually, Dan McGowan from WDPR.com, who led the league in journalistic greatness when it came to covering this mayor's race. But we caught him on our radio microphones, even though he works downstairs. So what? This campaign about how Providence is this, you need to know, know a guy's city. Isn't this the ultimate insider deal? No, it's quite the opposite. We have uh, a, a, unfortunately, someone who's right now uh, in a position to win the Democratic primary if we didn't work together, who is the king of the NOAA guy, uh, running against uh, the former king of the NOAA guy system. And that all of us who care about ethics and transparency and good government need to stand together to finally turn the page on corruption. So you're saying no deal has been cut. Do you intend to work with Jorge if he is elected mayor? Have you cut a deal there? What we have agreed to is that neither one of us want to see our city go backwards. Yeah, well, okay, and then Jorge Alorza had to answer because he just made Brett Smiley the COO, Chief Operating Officer, which I've never heard of before. Uh, I get what COOs do. I'm not sure what a COO does in the mayor's office. They got a chief of staff they already hired, and he's a COO, and you got a mayor, and whatever, but uh, there was no quid pro quo deal, says the new mayor-elect. I never, ever made him a promise about a job, and he made that decision to, to, um, to support my campaign anyhow, so he deserves a lot of credit for that. But over the past several months, we've worked together, we've worked very closely together. I've seen how his skills complement mine. Well, that's all nice. Listen, I have no qualms with Brett Smiley being hired by Jorge Alorza, if that's what he thinks he needs to do. But I'll be a monkey's uncle if this wasn't hinted at, discussed, or handshaken on back in the primary season. And for these guys who've made transparency and honesty all about their mayoral campaign against the big bad guy who did, make, did nothing but make deals, I'd like to be able to say, come on, man, as I rip off ESPN like I'm apt to do. Come on, man. You know what? You know, I wasn't born yesterday, and neither was anybody watching the show, and neither was anybody who voted in Providence. It doesn't bode well for the beginning. And you know what? To be honest with you, maybe you don't make that kind of hire, so you show some, hey, brand new, you know, wide, eyes wide open type of disposition. Because that's the Noah guy stuff. Different flavor. All right, next item. Yeah, they, they really got to be careful here. Don't mess this up. The Republican Party 
power play begins amongst House Republicans. By the way, we're catching up for a couple of days because we had a, uh, an evergreen show on Monday, and we just spent time on a Veterans Day yesterday, so we haven't had any rundown time, so I'm kind of catching up here. Yeah, the House Republicans are a little bit of to-do. Patricia Morgan, see, I mean, that, that's a bad picture of Patty. She looks like she's just sat on a grenade or something. I don't know, I, but the, um, she smiles. Uh, but she's pretty intense, and uh, after winning three times now in Coventry, I think guess she's thinking that she ought to maybe be a leader there. Uh, internal disputes at this point is not what this growing, very small growth of Republicans need. And Brian Newberry talked to Buddy Cianci on the radio about it yesterday. You know, Patricia Morgan, who I have a lot of respect for, uh, right. I mean, anybody that can win her district as a Republican for three straight elections yeah. is a fighter. And, you know, she has her own point of view on how things ought to go, and, and she wanted to throw her name into the contest, and that's fine. But, you know, that, that kind of came out of left field. That's why we didn't have a vote. Nice not to have a fight in a phone booth this legislative session, don't you think? So get it together behind closed doors and come out unified, for heaven's sake. Otherwise, the GOP won't be effective at all. We'll talk to the new representative about that, see what he thinks. In the meantime, we go to the next item. And that is that we're all bad. Well, we're all stupid. Well, did you see the headline on this Washington Post? This consultant for Obama from MIT, this Jonathan Gruber, uh, has been caught a year later. Some videotape has come out from a conservative group who posted it on YouTube. Uh, Mr. Gruber was discussing amongst, you know, high-thinking individuals how they put the Obamacare legislation together. He's an architect of the plan. And for the most part, he was saying, you know what, um, Look, this thing was so complicated, and it was so important to do that transparency might have been nice, but uh, people are stupid anyway. Watch this. Lack of transparency is a huge political advantage. And basically, you know, call it the stupidity of the American voter or whatever, but basically that was really, really critical to getting the thing to pass. And, you know, it's the second best argument. Look, I wish Mark was right. We could make it all transparent, but I'd rather have this law than not. So it's kind of like his reporter story. You know, yeah, there's things I wish I could change, but I'd rather have this law than not. I guess it's the ends justify the means. Look, that's not going to help the White House, nor is it going to help the minority in Congress right now, and it's not going to help for the 2016 elections. And it's not going to help the way people feel about Obamacare. But here's also what's not going to help. The American people need to take a little bit of an introspective look. When an MIT professor calls us stupid, it is no doubt arrogant and out of line. But the truth of the matter is, is that we don't pay much attention. That document, the thousands of pages that were in it, were a little bit too much even for the people who voted for it. I get it. But even basic civics, we're not that good at anymore. And so you've got to take some of his comments with a little bit, a little bit of, a little bit of acceptance. All right, next slide. Uh, yeah, fascinating, no doubt. Headline in the Washington Post. Yes, Robert O'Neill is the guy who got Osama bin Laden. And uh, Fox has had this on in uh, the 10 o'clock hour the last couple of nights, and he talks about uh, uh, the nature of the game and actually when they finally breathe a sigh of relief after they got him. 80-something minutes into it, somebody came over the radio to everybody and said, all right, gentlemen, for the first time in your lives, you're going to be happy to hear this. Welcome to Afghanistan. And everyone's like, oh my God, we just did it. We just pulled it off and we got him. And we all live, we're all fine. It was, ins it was insane. So then there was high five and, and, and stuff. Guys were like, cause I mean, we got us on the lot and we're gonna live. Amazing. It is amazing. It's very, the story is very compelling and it's titillating and it's war and it's the worst villain in the history of the world, at least in modern times for us. And it's all of that. But it gives me some pause because I thought that the SEALs do their job and never talk about it. And in this world where we're Snapchatting and we're, you know the whole story, Facebooking and everyone's looking for 15 minutes of fame, I never thought that that would permeate SEAL Team 6. And it's happened not once, but twice. And that, I think is a concern, but I'll watch it, but it's probably not right. What is right is seeing a two on the gas signs these days, and long story short, I was, uh, I was pumping gas last night. I talked about this on the radio, the Dan York Show, weekdays noon to three. I filled up at 319 a gallon at the gouging gas station near my 
highway exit last night and felt guilty about it the entire time because I think we all have a responsibility as consumers to drive the price down for each other. With prices at $2.99 and less with discount cards and the like, we have to do our best to shop right. Not the supermarket, but for gas. It's great to see it too. I don't know how long that's going to last. The dynamics of oil prices have finally trickled down to us over the course of time. Think about the savings. I mean, just at 20 cents a gallon, never mind in the high threes where it would be. I did the average on the way I drive. It's like a $1,000 difference in annual budget from two years ago to now, if it lasts. Shop smart. When we come back, a new Republican. Oh, yes, my state of mind just caught me. We moved that segment up. Let's do it. This is how you get in touch with the show. 228-1886. Good save, Jess. Uh, and you know all the rest. Here's a, a voicemail. She seems like a great product, but so far I haven't seen a, a woman sitting in that chair uh, wearing two to three inch ha heels. I'm just wondering how comfortable it would be for someone wearing high heels. Thank you. Uh, that was Monday Night Show. Focal Upright is the product, local company, great story. I asked my consultants, Laura and Jess, they hate heels, so they don't know. Your theories are welcome. Now we'll break, and then we'll come back for our new state rep. Thank you. Now look, I am tough on Republicans in this state, have been historically, but I will tell you that I was the first one to say the day after the election, hey, not bad, you know, not bad. Here was the headline, and uh, here's the list of the new Republicans. Actually, Dan Riley had been unelected, and then he has been reelected, but the other four are brand new to the scene, I believe, and Robert Nardolillo is first up. I will invite everybody in here to get a perspective. Congratulations. Thank you. That is a, uh, that's an accomplishment. You actually beat Scott Guthrie, who was an incumbent, um, and throttled him. What up with that? How did that happen? Uh, I think the, the people in the area were looking for something different, and they were lacking, and from me campaigning after work, going door to door, I had an opportunity to really connect with a lot of folks. I should mention, you should mention, the district is, so people aren't confused. District 28. Which is? Coventry. It's not. My district is just solely Coventry. Okay, go ahead. And um, I had an opportunity to hear uh, the same conversation almost over and over just from a different mouth, which was, we don't really know our representative, and we've never had really an opportunity for him to hear our needs. And it. it Connecting with the people didn't necessarily mean agreeing on what they were saying. It was just they wanted to be heard. They wanted someone just to listen. The fire district stuff has been a big thing there, right? It's brutal. Uh, every community has their own issues. Mm -hmm. Oz is really our fire district. Um, moving from Cranston into a town, uh, entirely different because uh, living in Cranston prior to living in Coventry uh, for the past eight years, you see fire districts now and they're managed under their own roof and some are being managed properly and some are not being managed properly and um, you know everybody has their own opinion um, but public safety is a, a huge issue. Well there's been some back and forth between the state government's been involved in trying to create some solutions for the Central Coventry Fire District situation. Guthrie was in the middle of that a little bit and um, I think there's an overall feeling there that the, the people haven't been heard about what they want to, to kind of zero base that whole situation. What was supposed to be a big money savings merger thing has been anything but, right? Correct. So. And there's still no resolve to that at this time. And, and people are receiving um, tax bills and they're very frustrated because uh, they, they had stepped out several times to voice their opinion on what they were able to afford for their public safety and it was, uh, it was ignored. Talk to me about the mechanics of the race. How much money did you raise? Uh, just under 16. All right. So it was you, around 15 So change. you can manage it. Did you put your own money in? Did you, I did actually, you raise it all? I actually only put $100 of my own money well, in to start you. the account. So you had to hustle it up between the spaghetti dinners and whatever else you had to do, right? <laughs> yes, you correct. Can, but people have this misunderstanding that you can't finance a state rep race. It takes two things, a little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of elbow grease, a little bit of uh, maybe wear a couple pairs of shoes, but you can raise a reasonable amount of money, spend it locally in the local media, get your message out, and hustle and win. You can do that, and you just showed it. 
Correct. I think um, I don't want to say uh, money wins elections. I want to say that the hard work does. Message and that's, does. The message does. Correct. And and being able to have some tools. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. I didn't use all of that money. I really? was very no. I was very conservative. I I used probably seven thousand of it. I mean, I still have some left because I wanted to be prepared. You know, running my first campaign. You don't really know what you're going to run into and what you're going to need and what you're going to, you know, encounter. Because, uh, you know, a lot of this is mailings. People are mailing things. And I wanted to, first of all, I started campaigning very early, late June, because I knew I had just under 5,000 houses. And working until 4 o'clock, I wanted to start early before it started to get dark. And I was campaigning four hours a night. What drew you in? Um, public service. I don't see being in public office and doing what I do every day any different. Um, public service is really the foundation of what a legislator should be, and that's what we were lacking. By the way, Nardo Lillo, you get the name, right? Uh, you know the business. You're world famous for, for bringing people to their next stage, right? Correct. That's a whole other conversation. That's a whole other conversation, correct. Is it fair to say it's kind of a weird business? It's a unique business. Um, it's not for everyone. I grew up in the business. Um, I have several cousins in the business along with my brother. But there were also other relatives that they didn't feel that that was. Hmm. And it's a niche. It's a niche that, you know. Well, listen, it's recession proof. Right? If you're serving, uh, if you're serving the people okay. and you're doing the right thing, it's recession proof. And it's, very, and it's important because it's such, a, it's such an important facet of our lives, and it's a whole other conversation. But when we come back, I want to know what this guy's going to do when he gets in there. Next. So Bob Nardolillo is the state rep from Coventry. He's a, a freshman, never been in politics before, and won substantially over the incumbent Scott Guthrie. Uh, what do you want to do? Well, I think um, as legislators now, I, I think we're all on the same page in terms of economic development and jobs. And I think that All legislators or Republican legislators? I would probably say Republicans, but I, if you open up the Providence Journal and you live in Rhode Island, it's hard to deny what's happening here. It really is. It's hard to deny what's happening here. And I think we have to become more business friendly. And not so much as bringing businesses in, which is extremely important, but taking care of the ones that are here. The small businesses are our backbone here. And I remember, of course, I'm only 35 years old, but I remember opening up the, the newspaper and there was this huge section of help wanted. Now, now it's one piece of paper. Sometimes it's only a couple columns. That means there is no jobs out there. So these people are leaving. And, and that's a sad thing because a lot of these kids that I went to school with or even people coming out of college now, they're tending to stay in that area where they went to college because they're not able to come home and start a family back here because uh, they have to go where the jobs are. I mentioned in the monologue at, at the top of the show that uh, you guys can't really afford to be banging each other, Republican Party. I mean, having a fight in a phone booth this time around would be a problem because I think, frankly, going from six to eleven Republicans is a demonstrative restart for the for the party in the General Assembly, and you're probably closer aligned with the Speaker of the House on politics than he is with the progressives on the Democratic side that are left, and so. You may be able to. You may be able to advance the cause that you're talking about. Yes. Yes, I if believe so. If you don't have all this turbulence, it's not that I'm against conflict, but that sometimes you got to go. Hey, we got some momentum here, right? I don't want to say conflict. I want to say passionate conversation. I think, um, as you said, our numbers doubled. Uh, well, there were freshmen coming in who wanted to uh, become more familiar with uh, the senior leadership that was there, and uh, once we make a decision. We'll be all under the same umbrella, fighting the same good fight that we always have. All right, so it's business in general, but is there something in specific that you want to champion as a brand new legislator? Uh, actually, one of my uh, platforms is public safety in terms of just when you turn on the news, you're seeing domestic violence, you're seeing sexual assault, you're seeing all these uh, uh, communities that people don't want to visit. Now, mind, mind you, come and bring their businesses here and actually live in these communities. We have to straighten out that, that legislation that's loose like that. So I'm looking forward to connecting with the, the Rhode Island uh, alliances in terms of safer communities. And uh, the domestic violence is a huge thing. And uh, 
the Rhode Island Coalition uh, Against Dem uh, Domestic Violence, I feel very strongly about. So those will be uh, platforms. Public, s public service and public safety are a huge issue with me, and uh, so me I think that's important. Give me a few seconds on the new governor, Gina Raimondo. You think she'll be what in office? Um, I have to say I'm very, uh, I'm optimistic. I always start out with that way. I, I say, you know, when people are uh, campaigning a certain direction, sometimes they're catering to a certain group of people to get elected. Mm. I didn't tend to do that because I wanted to be more straightforward. I hope that her campaign and what she actually does uh, is a little bit different. I hope she's very open-minded. I have to start off with saying that she is going to be our governor, so I have to have a lot of faith that she is going to do the best she can by us. Well, I think that's a very astute hope because sometimes they got to run way left in order to be able to qualify for the big show, right? Uh, come back a lot. Let us know what your dialogue is all about, and congratulations. Thank you so much. Way I appreciate enough. you having me. All right, Bob Nardolillo, new rep in the Commons, another Republican. Balance, you all say you want balance. Final thought, I was queasy today, I'll tell you why. Stay with us. During the radio show on WPR today, I was freaking out watching the television as we watched this. Uh, oh, I have to hold on to the table now just even thinking about it. I'm not a big height guy. How's that for a little personal? Oh, my goodness. That was 69 floors high. They got, I think, three of the guys, the three of the guys, they got them out of there. I have such respect for people who work heights with fearlessness. The firefighters that broke the window and got them, the three guys who were able to walk out of there. I wonder if they'll go back to work tomorrow like it was no big deal. I don't have any idea, but I'm looking forward to finding out. Whew. Good for you guys. Not for me, that's for sure. A coach, a unique coach tomorrow night on Daniel State of Mind. See you on the radio at noon.